This is his remote room. Have you any remote ideas to the meaning of the word? What's up? Yo. Hey, hey. What's good in the hood? I was trying to think of a good question. I don't have anything good to ask right now. Just a normal, dreary, cloudy day here in old Memphis, Tennessee. It's actually kind of cloudy here, and it's never cloudy here. So that means it's going to typhoon or whatever it's called. I don't think that's what it's called. Like, RubyConf tickets still aren't on sale yet, are they? They are not. At least they weren't on sale yesterday when I looked. I've already Hmm. booked, like, my stay. I'm like, (laughs) I don't know. We're getting kind of close, aren't we? We are. Uh, September 17th today, registration is now live. So. Oh, damn. Today. There you go. Yeah. Hold on. Pause. (laughs) Yeah, so looks like it's open. Cool. In-person tickets still there, still a thing. I was wondering. Do I have an account? I'm doing this live. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah, gonna wait till Monday. Your, don't read your credit card number out loud. You said four two four two four two four two four two four two four two. A little little stripe humor for you. Um, oh, I get it. Oh. Get out of here. Oh, that's like so far over my head. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I feel ashamed oh. now. Because oh, that I was a good were, joke. No, uh, I thought you were mocking me. No, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Now I get it. Now I think it's funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> that reminded me. I got to get a hotel room for Chris's air quote wedding in a couple of weeks. So, <laughs> yeah. Are you getting air yeah. quote wedded? Well, we already got married, but. All of the things had down payments and we lose all those if we like canceled the wedding. So we were like, I guess we'll just push it off a year. So that's weirdly coming up because we like sat down and talked to the florist or whatever last week, I think. And it was like, just strange. Like we last talked to them like a year and a half ago or something or whatever. And it was like, yeah, I guess the real wedding is happening. But now it's not a real wedding. It's like, I don't know what you call it. Val renewals. Party, so, party, yes. So, looking forward to it. So, same when you said florist, I knew exactly what it was, but my mind still went to you building your house. I'm like, you don't call people who lays floors florist. <laughs> That's why I always like to joke that you guys at Podi are podiatrists, <laughs> dude. Dude, I kid you not. I went to the doctor like a year ago. And they printed my paperwork and it said Memphis Podiatry Center of Memphis. And I was like, nope. So I like put a line through Memphis and then everything after Podia. And I was like, this is where I work. So <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Excited for that. I'm glad Ruby Comp's going to happen. Now I got to decide if I'm going to go. Yeah. We it live, looks like we it's, live and we learn. It's only 200 bucks for a virtual ticket. So if I am. I don't know. I'll probably be busy those days, but virtual tickets, not too bad. $600 in person, just about what you would expect. So maybe I'll do the online track, hang out in the chat rooms. Oh, they are requiring vaccinations. I knew that face masks were required, but when you go to register, yeah. So, okay. Oh, cool. What's new with you guys? Any, any interesting projects you've been working on this week? I've been working on the mock-up generator I've been telling you about. A lot of JavaScript, so I haven't talked a lot about it on here. It doesn't seem super relevant, but... What about your uh, secret JavaScript podcast that nobody knows yeah. about? Remote JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> it would just be me still talking about Webpacker for an hour each week. <laughs> uh, no, it's I'm at the Ruby side of it now. But just to recap, you like pick a product and... We show the products and then you like choose your design, like your mock-up and you put it on the product. You can resize it, rotate it, stuff like that. You can put multiple designs front and back of product. And so basically what I've opted to do because JavaScript's not my forte is let Ruby do all the like exporting of the images. So basically like someone will give us an email address and we will take all their designs And my plan is like run it through a background job and basically rebuild what they had in the client on the server. So Uh, you're kind of taking a number of images that were uploaded and keeping track of their like location and scale 
and rotation or whatever and sending all that info to, to Rails to recreate in Image Magic or something. Exactly. I thought about well, trying to tackle it from the DOM because like, I'm sure there's some JavaScript library that would like take a snapshot of like a DOM like element. You could do like those full web page screenshots and then crop, crop that it. down. To- <laughs> it would probably, in hilarious. hindsight, it would have been easier, but like. Uh, yeah. Maybe the canvas or something. Are you do How are you doing your uh, rendering of those images on top of each other and stuff? So what I, I have a React component that's called like design. And so it design in this context is like each image they upload. And so you can have like multiple of them and they sit on a designer component that has the product. So each design you add has position absolute, top zero, left zero. So I thought like, okay, that is a way I can always know when I'm looking at this, like everything is based off like zero, zero. So I'm using a library called movable in the front end. And it actually gives me the like resizing, rotating and dragging functionality. So every time you upload an image, it's put like, it's in theory, zero, zero. And right now I don't let you like change priority of like layers and stuff or anything like that. So like the latest updated image sits on top, but yeah, there was some logic there around trying to get the design to be centered when you upload it. Cause I was like, it would be kind of a crummy experience if it was like in the top left corner. So I have a react hook that listens for the image load event and then gets the height and width of its like parent container divides it in half, like height and width, and then takes the design, divides it in half and knows how to center it. It's like hacky code, but it works. It makes um, sense. Yeah. I know about that. Yeah, it'd be life. weird if it if it dropped it up in the left corner every yeah. single time. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. not what you would expect. Or you would see it and you'd be like, this seems crappily built. But if it shows up in the middle, you'll be like, oh, that, that makes sense. That's where I, I expect it to drop, which is hilarious because it's such a tiny change. But like, I, for one, would be like, if it's always in the top left, I'm going to be like, this developer was kind of lazy or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Especially if you like drop an asset that's like really large and then it's like way larger than the artboard. And then the you have to like <laughs> then go find like the anchors and scale it back down or something like that. I know all about that placing stuff on canvas with like points and geometry life. So I like, I really haven't had to do much in terms of like, like I'm not using any like actual like web canvas stuff. Maybe I should be, but like this library I'm using too lets me set bounds. So you can't drag it outside of the div. And when I insert it, I make whatever you insert comes down to like 200 pixels wide. Anyway, the thing that's interesting about, I mean, it's all interesting to me. This has been a fun project, but like the interesting thing is, okay, how do I translate all this to Rails? Not only do we let you do like multiple designs on different angles, we also let you like create like a run of mockups. You could choose another product. And then when you click export, that's when we need to generate all that. So it happens Ruby, it happens Rails side. Every time you upload an image, I'm using active storage, direct upload, so that when you hit submit, I don't have to wait for 30 images to upload in a post request. And then It's got all the designs, the signed IDs for the designs. Like Chris said, X, Y, height, width, and rotation. And then it just goes through and starts layering the images on top of each other, rail side, and writes the file. Oh, God. I know a lot about this type of crap in Rails. I can't like explain why, but I do. What happens if you have like a PNG layered on top of a JPEG? Did I say that? I might have said that backwards. Yeah. Where like one yeah. has a background and one doesn't. Well, a PNG on top of a JPEG will like well, it you will can have honor a tra- the you transparency. Have... Okay, Will. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Dang, you can thought of everything. Yeah, I didn't have to do anything for that. The thing I ran into is actually if you rotate an image with image magic, it will apply a background to the image. Like if I rotate an image like 
45 degrees. It is, it's hard to explain. The image is still like the same image, but now it has a white background. And so like, I had to like set background to be like RGB 0000, like RGBA to get it to like stay transparent when you rotate it, no matter what type of image, if that makes sense. Yeah. I just I wonder if some printers that won't honor that. And that's the only reason I asked. It's not actually like a mock-up tool to like send to the printer. It's actually more for like printers to show their people like, hey, this is the product I have and this is your design. This is like what it'll look like when I print it. Right. Kind of like an inbit. Yeah. There's always one guy that always prints everything. <laughs> I've had Excel hand, like spreadsheets just handed to me before. I was yeah. going to ask, uh, how are you doing the commands like with the image processing or mini magic or magic? And then along with that, like, are you doing all of them at once or do you have to like do com- combine like two at a time and chain the outputs? So I'm still in the process of getting like multiple happening right now. I've been mostly working on like, a uh, mock-up at a time. I started with R magic, got kind of nervous about like started reading about memory usage with R magic, switched to mini magic. I've had memory issues with R magic. Okay. Well, that's good because I read that I went to mini magic. I didn't even look at image processing. I should have, but mini magic's been doing the trick so far. I also looked at cloudinary to be honest. Like I thought about pushing all this. They have these like transformation APIs. Yeah. They do. Uh, I, that's what I was going to ask if you. You had mentioned earlier that you were using Mini Magic, but like that's something that you could definitely do with Cloudinary, especially for the like they have these APIs that will like zoom to faces and stuff like that. When you were talking earlier about like how things crop and thing stuff, so Cloudinary is great. Shout out. Yeah, it's cool. The reason I was looking at Cloudinary is because when you rotate an image on the client, the origin of like rotation is the center of the image. So like, yeah, if, if it was like the top left, it looked like a pinwheel yeah. or something like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But using this library in the client, the X and Y values don't change. If that makes sense. It's kind of sus. So, right. It kind of makes sense. So excuse, like, I guess, cause you would lose that point. Uh, of or, like when you flip it, the yeah. X and Y changes. So if you're wanting to like maintain that original point, so that you keep rotating on that original point. I mean, that makes sense, I guess. Uh, that's not what I would expect. So, yeah, everything works. Like resizing XY when I send it over works fine. But when I rotate it, it rotates it. The origin is the top left. So my image, if I rotate it 45 degrees, is pushed over by the difference in the rotation of plus X and Y. And that's when I was like maybe Cloudinary would be easier for me to like figure all this out, but I pushed through it. There's no secret. I'm not very good at math. Don't feel like I should be a programmer. I'm not good at math. What I ended up doing was, well, I know where X and Y of the image is of the like design. I know where the height and width of the product. So in theory, I know what the origin should be. So basically if you're rotating, I have a, I have It's not a bunch of math. It's like four lines. You can rotate an image and then say, basically like remove it, like move it back to where the origin was on the client and it works. And it was like four lines. And I was like, not even going to refactor it. Just keep going. Nice. Yeah. Some scary stuff. I love it. It is. It's spooky. shit. (laughs) The magical commands of image magic and FFmpeg are uh, two great mysteries of life. The amount of things you can do with those are pretty fascinating. <laughs> I, I use it for so much. It's, it, it can do so many things. I can't even fathom all it can do. So image magic, if someone's listening doesn't know, is like an, I don't even know the right term for it, but it's like a graphics like processing library, but it's not like Ruby specific. It's like system specific. Like you install image magic on your server and then basically mini magic or R magic are gems that like wrap those commands. It's insane. Like I fell down an image magic rabbit hole of like all the stuff you could do. And you could build a cloudinary on something like that. Like you could build your own cloudinary. It's cool. 
I wouldn't even really be surprised if Cloudinary wasn't built on that, honestly. I mean, I know there's like a degree of machine learning as well, but like at the end of the day, like I've done some really cool stuff with image magic that I can't talk about. You could do everything in Photoshop that you can do in image magic. Yeah. I can't remember if it was Cloudinary or image magic, like can handle layers, stuff like that. It's just kind of fun because like it is still passing data from a client to a server. But it's like different from what I do every day. So it's been a fun change of pace just to I don't know, build something kind of interactive. And I feel kind of smart for once. It's fun. It's all that awesome math you got to write. Maybe you actually love math. Maybe. It's a, it's a whole other conversation for another time. But I wonder <laughs> if I would have been diagnosed with ADHD earlier and like on medicine, if I would have actually been pretty good at math class. Sounds like you've been making good progress on this, though. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully like put it out soon. It's cool. And I'm excited to get it done. Move it off Webpacker to ES build. I haven't done that yet because all the ES build stuff happened like the week after I started this project. (laughs) If it goes as easy for you as it did for me with Jumpstart, you're going to have a good time because I think we moved all of Jumpstart over in like an hour from Webpack. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, wow. Webpacker to ES build and the CSS bundling and it just worked. I mean, there's a little bit of things that I wrote my own import glob plugin for ES build because the ones that were there, well, actually I have a few JavaScript files that don't have exports. So when you import them, the glob plugins are like looking for the export default, which I don't have. And I just needed to import the the code from a folder and I didn't want to go write everyone in case people added more or whatever. So aside from that, took like an hour. There's been definitely more hours, but making it nice and polished, but and just cleaning up things like uh, the old Webpacker comments of like, this file is compiled by Webpacker and you go configure it here or whatever. Got rid of those things. And, but yeah, I'm blown away. JavaScript compiles in 0.18 0.18 seconds and Tailwind compiles in one second instead of like 10 seconds or whatever. So it is uh, very speedy and I like it, but I had to go and make it a little nicer in development mode. So like when you boot up your app for the first time and you didn't run yarn, run build and build CSS, I wrote a little before action in development that checks to see if those files are compiled and then it runs that if they're not. So if you forget to run the watchers, it still works and doesn't give you an error right off the bat. So that's cool. Is it kind of like how Webpacker does when like you start basically the same like idea? Like I start a rail server, Webpacker hasn't compiled. I'm not running the dev server. It'll yeah. pause everything, finish compiling, then load. Yes and no. Originally, that's what I did for ES build. So the way that the Webpacker version works is it actually checks to see if the Webpacker socket is open and if Webpack dev server is actually responding to that 3035 on localhost or whatever, then it will skip compiling during a request. But unfortunately, you know, that's not as simple with Tailwind or ES build. So like I wrote a plugin or a kind of a wrap around the ES build stuff to write boot up uh, node, write the PID file to temp directory, and then Rails can check if that PID exists. But I was having some trouble cleaning up the file like consistently because of, I don't know what the reasons were exactly. But then also trying to do that with the Tailwind CLI, wasn't entirely sure how to do that nicely there. We could write like a little wrap around either one that writes like a PID or something and run a, a different script before you run the Tailwind CLI or something. But rather than doing all that, which was, you know, that's the ideal. And if you could get it consistent to clean up the PID file, then it's probably great without too much extra effort. But for this, it's honestly just like, hey, is there an application CSS? And if there is, then, okay, we'll just basically... Kind of the same check. It's actually exactly the same check as when you render and Sprockets is like, hey, this file doesn't exist in the asset pipeline. Like you're missing application JS. I actually went and read the source code for that method, find where it does the check. And I run the exact same check in a before action and just compile it in development. So 
it's not going to be as nice because it just checks to see if the file exists, which means that if you modify those, it's not going to change it or recompile where Webpack integration did. So eh, it's not perfect, but the PID solution or something like that would do a more equivalent job. But could you use like, like listen not gem? Like maybe, probably. Isn't that what this is for? I mean, it, you would probably need to run some similar in problems, node, right? Or sort of a, an equivalent. Well, what I don't want to do is end up building Rails like Spring. Run it. Oh yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Actually, that is a quick <laughs> way back to Spring. I was Never just mind. thinking like minimal dependencies, and, and like my ES build wrapper was simple. Where it's like, okay, we boot, we check to see if there's a PID file. If there already is, we raise an error and say like, hey, you can't run this twice. And if there's not, then we write the file and then try and listen to the on exit callback, but yes, build also listens to that stuff. And I don't know if it was forking or whatever, but I had some interesting stuff where like that callback just sometimes wouldn't run. And then sig int and sig term and stuff would like, if you define sig int, then the exit callback ran. But if you didn't define sig int, exit never ran. It was kind of strange. So I, I didn't really get as far as I wanted to on that. But then also I didn't know you know, I guess we could do a similar wrapper around the Tailwind CLI or something, but I left it there and was like, we'll just run this Tailwind command. Yeah, I always use multiple processes anyway because I have to run Sidekick, so I just use Overmind. Yep, and, and Rails CSS bundling like installs Foreman, and right. that's the, the bin dev file. So it's kind of like we could go down that path, but if Rails is saying, look, if you're going to use these bundling libraries, just run Overmind or Foreman. And I was like, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole of trying to make these work exactly like what Packer did. So I figure just uh, be good in your documentation of now you've got to run multiple processes at once for sure. But if you ever forget, at least Rails will run without an error, at least. So, and maybe that's not a good thing. Maybe that error is something I should just rescue from and say, hey, need to run Foreman or Overmind instead, but well, I mean, when your JavaScript that. works, like eventually, like, I don't know. I feel like that's like, you make that mistake once or twice and then don't anymore. Yeah. Well, it's just that the, like, most of it's just the error is kind of, you it's know, like, it doesn't make sense. Right. Like you're like, how is the application JS file missing? Because it's right here and you know, it's not quite a descriptive enough or whatever. Right. But, I will say that the context uh, that Rails has, like it has, it only knows what it knows in the confines of its own space. So it, when something yeah. inside of Rails isn't happening, it's like I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's not aware of all that other stuff that happened ahead of time. But yeah, I will say the upgrade process was like really simple. You have to be a little bit careful of your manifest and your app assets config folder because if you leave the style sheet link tree or directory or whatever in there that can include your application CSS, in which case it's not going to deploy to production, correct? Because you want that assets builds folder to be the one that it picks up instead of the the source application CSS. But overall, um, impressed, very impressed, so fast and so simple compared to all the stuff that we had configs and whatever. And I probably... I don't know if I have the PR up here, but I probably deleted. Yeah, here we go. Added 392 lines, deleted 2,215 lines. So feels good. Oh, man. Pretty much 1,800 less lines. I'm sure a lot of that was the yarn lock or something, but still pretty solid. Minor details. Minor details. Just let it be a win. Yep. So... I'm very happy with it. I think it's going to be a great way to go forward. Chris, you know what really just bugs me? Hmm. It seems like it's on the tip of my tongue. Bugs. Oh, dang it. I <laughs> knew it. All bugs. Of course. Real bugs. Bugs in my app. Bugs Bunny. Anything with a bug in it bugs yeah, me. I, I can see why. I can see why. So I'm asking, Chris, for your professional opinion as a thought leader in the industry, how should I handle these bugs? You know, I, I learned in school that, that honey badgers are really good with bug problems. 
You mean a literal honey badger? Or maybe honeybadger.io. But if I sign up for Honey Badger, what do I get? Well, something that is really useful that actually just saved my butt the other day was their uptime monitoring. I was doing an update on one of my apps and uh, made a deploy and didn't notice right away that it went down. So that was a really good, useful feature there. Not to mention that they've got your error monitoring for those bugs. Bugs. Yeah. You should go check out Honey Badger, it sounds like. Sounds like it. See you, Chris. <laughs> we all had a good laugh on Twitter about Rail 7. But oh, yeah. I, I am actually <laughs> like pretty excited to give it a whirl. And I don't usually like run alphas, but I don't know. It feels like this was all the icing on the cake and really like solidified rail seven to me, all the JS bundling and CSS bundling stuff. How is it running Pody on rail seven alpha? Oh yeah. It's great. <laughs> uh, yeah. Shipped we'll, it, we'll shipped include, it immediately. Uh, sh- we'll that include a link to those tweets. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I've actually did start the upgrade because I just finished a rail six, one point one four, whatever. I upgraded a Rails five app to Rails six, and it hasn't been deployed yet. So I was like, "Well, maybe I'll like see what happens moving it on ahead to Rails seven since I like already like was just in this context." So far, it so it's good. I have a little TurboLinks thing. I was taking the lazy way of like, let's just update the app first, get the Ruby working, and then we'll Lame. work our way back. Now, come on, Lame. I'm not in a position where I can't switch off Webpacker. We're not there yet either. Yeah, because I have SaaS dependency stuff and other things that I can't control. So there are a few TurboLinks things. How the, the switching it over to use Turbo was when I was starting to be like, uh, maybe I'm maybe I'll go play Rocket League. TurboLinks to Turbo is not a quick upgrade. So yeah. Kind of roundabout lucky for us. We haven't used TurboLinks historically, but we are trying Turbo in certain parts of the app now. Uh, so. Andrea has been doing most of the turbo work this week. The reason I was late getting here today, we were like trying to make some JavaScript still work with the new turbo stuff. And when I say JavaScript, I mean React. And but she actually got the app booting on Alpha 2. I haven't talked to her about it, but she sent us a screenshot. So I don't know how it is with the app, but she was able to do it. It's not in production. Cool. Because I'm sure people are going to be going through this upgrade process now that it's like the default in Rails. But are you doing, because Turbo is going to try to take over all your forms and all your links and all that. Are you doing that piecemeal or how's that going? We're setting Turbo Drive to false by default and we're opting into it. So I didn't know you could do that. My life I didn't know that you could do that either. changed. Jason, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Andrea. So she's actually got it to where like when she imports turbo right below, it, it's like turbo drive something. Oh, let me, you know what? Let me just, that's amazing. Let me just like, look at it right now. Um, turbo I, drive. That's going to solve all my problems. I don't want turbo and all my forms on any of them really, except for one. Oh, cool. Oh, but you should. I, I know that I bridge. should, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find it and share it. But yeah. And so then like we have, I don't know if this, I don't know much about turbo, but I know that like we have it to where like on a body or a div, we can be like turbo drive true. And I don't know if she's like written a custom listener or that comes from turbo, but yeah, that's how we're doing it. Cause it's not going to be on all. Yeah. Turbo dot session dot drive equals false. Okay. And so, yeah, like so she's like, uh, she's updated our event listeners to like turbo load on these like certain pages. Uh, Cause she was saying that also turbo load fires like the same as like DOM content loaded when you first load the page. Like right. you can actually replace DOM content loaded with it, which is cool. Even if you have session drive equal to false, it will still do it. Oh, interesting. Well, I guess nice. that makes sense because it's just that's the interception of links and forums, I guess. Yeah, I was looking at Connor's MRU JS today because I was like, you know, going through and doing some final changes on JS bundling. And I want to also get rid of UJS, but there's 
there's no current replacement for the disable with and data confirm. And I didn't really want to have people go and like add a data controller confirm instead, which wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, but I was hoping just to, to make it a bit more compatible. And I think, I think he's going to be working on making it so you can import just portions of it. Cause right now you can kind of like import it all and opt out of some stuff, but I really only wanted a couple of features to import. So I think he's going to be working on that, which sounds pretty cool because I didn't really have hardly any UJS usage anywhere. Most of that was just to import a Rails Ajax call once and then data disable with and confirm. So I switched that over to Rails request JS for the Rails Ajax request. And now the only last piece is kind of getting a replacement for the disable with and confirm. So yeah, I guess other than that, I'll be able to drop UJS, which seems strange because that's something that I've had ever since the beginning of my Rails career, it feels like. So it's weird to see that go away. In the, the beginning, end of an era. there was UJS. <laughs> I've been trying to get Connor on the show to talk about MRUJS for a while. So Connor, I know you listen to the show. This, this is the official <laughs> invite. Yes. yes. Like, yep. I have officially invited him multiple out of times. This public one. Yeah, this is we, a call We out. talked about this in our <laughs> Discord, wanting Connor to join us. We actually have a few invites to other people that are still waiting. But specifically right now, Connor, message Andrew to come on the show. Connor, please. We need your big brain. It would be so good. Yes. I, I did a call with Connor. I just like DM'd him today. It's like, hey, I just want to like hang out with you. And we talked for like 20 minutes and it was like, such an insightful 20 minutes. He's smart. I've been talking to Connor since he joined the Stimulus Reflex community. I have never heard his voice before he went on Brittany's podcast. <laughs> well, it's funny. So come on so we can all hear your beautiful voice, Connor. Yes. Let's make it happen. Or we oh, need Andrew, to go. You're Brittany keeping up the sports theme. And, oh, yeah, yeah. Sports I'm ball. going to the, the Cardinals game this weekend. Because the stadium is like 20 minutes away. Chris also Ayers. has a Cardinals team. Yes, the, right. the lessers. Well, speaking, all right, hold on, hold on. So I've got my Diamondbacks hat. So down with the St. Louis Cardinals. And is that the I, Diamondbacks logo? Yeah. God, I haven't watched the Diamondbacks since like they won the World Series in the 90s. I was in 2001. <laughs> it's the 20th anniversary. Well, I've, been, I've been going to some Diamondback games. Thing. 2001, 1999, they kind of all blur together. <laughs> they kind of so. blended for you. The Arizona Cardinals are a football team and they dominated on last Sunday and they have a younger quarterback who was hurt last season that I didn't really watch football last season. I don't know because it was, I don't know. I just didn't. And they look really good and they have DeAndre Hopkins now and they were kind of balling. So I was like, dude, I, and the same is only 20 minutes away. And I was like, I have to go watch the first home game is the Sunday. So That's I'll cool. be there. Yeah, and I'm only 15, I'm 15 minutes from the Diamondbacks in the Phoenix Suns arena. Were you this into sports in Carolina? Like nothing was around for like hours and hours. I lived near Charlotte when I was, and I loved to go see the Panthers play. But like it was like an hour drive and I didn't have money to do it. And when I lived in Wilmington, it was like four hour drive. And I'm not going to drive four hours. There's no baseball in North Carolina either. So. I get it. And there's no, and the Bobcats suck. Well, we had the Bobcats for a while and they sucked when I was there. But now that they're back to the Hornets and they've got LaMelo, they're playing better, but they were bad. And it's, it's the convenience of it. It's like the tickets aren't that expensive and the stadium's only 15, 20 minutes away and I can just go have fun on an afternoon. You should start a a sports podcast where you only talk about, no, (laughs) no, only talk about North Carolina and, Arizona, Arizona sports. sports. I'll do it for you. It'll be a subscriber only. My OnlyFans podcast. <laughs> oh. That's yeah. how they tried to market it was like content creators to go there for like content, like just like a Gumroad kind of has this like deal where like if you as a content creator want to put out content behind a paywall with pay podcasts, paid videos and like, you know, private things. Because the advertising model like hit a fan for YouTube and then everyone was like scrambling for like a new revenue model. And that's where all these kind of private sites came out. And I think, I don't know if they advertised it the way it turned out now, but they were still trying to be like, no, but we're for everyone. Everyone can come here. And we're like, no, not anymore. 
Not now that Reddit's had its field day and it's meme. There's too many memes. Once you've been memed, it's it's over. We've blown this conversation up enough. Why not? How about MailChimp for twelve billion dollars? Wait, no, I just switched off of MailChimp because I hated they, it. They got bought by into it. That's nice. Isn't that a weird kind of acquisition for Intuit? I feel like, like I thought Intuit just owns a bunch of companies. Aren't they kind of like Salesforce at this point? Probably. Well, I mean, they got $12 billion to throw around. So, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, like that. that's walk around <laughs> money, Chris. Come on. <laughs> and like the articles I've been reading, they were anti VC. Apparently, their thing was like, we're never going to sell. So, that was kind of their like, we're not going to give you equity. Supposedly, they paid really well for Atlanta, but it was like, we're not going to give equity. Apparently, like two or three people just own that company outright and sold it for $12 billion. That like, is nice. Yeah. Someone's on a yacht right now. <laughs> a few that's, yachts. Oh, that's a lot of money. <laughs> They're yacht racing right now, actually. <laughs> I want a yacht race. Do they get afford to go to uh, space next year or whatever? They're going to have their own rocket companies. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, I saw a lot of people on Twitter that were like, they didn't give any, you know, equity and all this money went straight to the founders and stuff. And I was like, yeah, but these people agreed for that. Like they got yeah, jobs. That was the agreement. Like I'd rather get paid. Probably getting equity. paid well. And those people as owners of the company didn't intend to sell. They bootstrapped it. And, you know, so it happened how it happened. But yeah, yeah. pretty insane. It's the thing I read platform. was like. There is a price. Like people change their mind, and it twelve billion dollars is the price I would also yeah. sell out for. Yeah, um, I wouldn't be opposed to that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, anyway, since we were just yeah. just taking the back roads to the end of this podcast, I thought I would take in the back roads, <laughs> dude. That I have never heard that, and I love it. Taking <laughs> the back roads to the end of the podcast. Welcome to the end of the podcast. Well, I ordered my Ruby Cop ticket while we were talking. I'll be there. Uh, I think I'm going to go. Uh, I just got to confirm it with Shannon before I'm like, hey, let's go. It's the nice part of being alone. <laughs> you can just go do stuff. <laughs> no, one, uh, no one to answer to. Help yeah, I have, oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, I'm here with y'all. We're all wearing red. You brought up my red. red. We're all wearing red. Yeah. All wearing red. This Everybody is, listening obviously knew that. Red's my favorite color. This is a Mega Maker shirt, and it is one of the two most comfortable shirts I have. The second one is a Less Films shirt that I got at Microcom that somehow uh, still fit. Mm. So shout out Less Films and Mega Makers for comfy shirts. Speaking of, I hope Microcom happens next year because I was going to go and then COVID happened. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. We're like two years into it at this point. I think, yeah, because you and I were going to like, we were at the same hotel we were for RailsConf and we were sharing a room again. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And it got canceled. Because there were several people I was going to meet for the first time there that I've known through GoRails or Twitter or whatever. And I was like really pumped for that, but it never happened. So I went to the, I don't remember what it was called. They did like a virtual one earlier this year. I heard about and that. And it was kind of cool. It wasn't for where I'm at, so I didn't get like a ton of value, but like I would like to get back to going to meet people. That's where I get value. Do they still kind of split it up into like the starter and growth? So this was like just like a one-off event and it was oh, like okay. a one day, five talks. Maybe it was two days, but my now former coworker, Kyle Fox was there. Right, it's like, He's now doing reward full time. So, but this platform they use for it, like you had like a little avatar and like you like are in this virtual conference room. So like you walk and like pick out a chair. And so like I went and found someone named Kyle and just stood in front of it. And I was like, is this you? Uh, he was <laughs> like 20 minutes later, like, yeah, it's me. And I was like, Phew. cause I stood there the whole time. Uh, oh God. Um, this is like playing second life, having a conference <laughs> in second life. Her World of Warcraft. <laughs> One of my favorite Dwight quote and from The Office. I like my life so much, I wanted a second one. Uh, <laughs> it's because he was playing Second Life. I created another one. Well. <laughs> no more debauchery. I think yeah, we're I, at the, Chris, uh, you know that's a Southern thing that you just did right there, right? 
you know oh. that like everywhere else like there's like this custom in the south of like when like a couple or someone's ready to leave they kind of just like slap their knee and they go well <laughs> and that's just kind of like a universal call sign to southern people that it's time to head out <laughs> exactly read the room <laughs> we're all southern ish ish yeah you're no, still you're technically southern. southern i am from the south you are definitely in the south jason i think you're maybe in the most south right now I live in the mid south geographically. Mouth. Sure, they, they call it the mid south. Hmm. It is geographically. I always call it the buckle of the Bible Belt. It's not really Nashville would probably be more the buckle, but and Chris, you're just somewhere else. <laughs> yep, in the ether, in the middle of <laughs> middle America. Middle of, uh, who knows what? Yeah, I swear to God, I think I live <laughs> in St. Louis because every night when I'm on Reddit. They've started this thing when you're going through your, I don't know if it's new. I'm a new Redditor, but like when you're going through <gasps> your, it's like, oh, you know, like you're a member of this subreddit. So you might like this. Mm-hmm. I swear to God, last night I saw like 50 St. Louis posts because it's like, oh, similar to our Memphis. So I know basically everything that's happened in your city in the last couple of days. A lot of not great news most of the time because <laughs> I subscribe to our St. Louis and it is, uh, yeah, it's rough. <laughs> I saw one that was like 500 comments and I was like, nah, <laughs> nah, the, the no. best parts, the best parts are where it's a repost from another subreddit. That's like terrible people or like bad drivers right. or something. And then Idiots somebody, cars. yeah, it's like somebody spotted that like, that's a St. Louis license plate or like the street or whatever. And then I'm like, yep, here we go. <laughs> uh, I, I sort by controversial on Reddit because I'm one of those people that, it that sounds about out. right for you. Yeah. yeah. Not all the time. Not on every subreddit, but on some subreddits, I, I like to sort by controversial, you know, just to get I my morning like, tea. I feel like the Ask Reddit subreddit um, is probably the one to do controversial gotta, on. Yeah. I, I don't really go on that one that much. Like the hard part of Reddit is like, you don't know who you're dealing with. And a lot of the time it's children. And once you realize that you're dealing with children, it's like, okay, all bets are off. Cause like, they're just saying like, the stupid, dumbest crap that you ever say, and but they have no idea what they're saying. And it's like, do I argue with this person? Probably not. I could be arguing with a five-year-old, you know, because they're giving five-year-olds iPads these days and some of these kids type like it. So it's just, you got to pick your battles on Reddit. We need to introduce Jason to 4chan. No, no, cut the pod. That's it. <laughs> cut it, cut it. <laughs> cut, cut it. End this now.